Welcome to the second half of part three of building the driving simulator sled. In this video, we'll talk about the keyboard tray. We'll also talk about the seat assembly and improvements to that design. And then lastly, we'll talk about the low end frequency base shakers and amp that drives the base shakers. If you haven't watched the first half of this part three video, I suggest you do that before watching this video. First up is the keyboard tray. Now this has seen several revisions. What I'm going to show you here is a mixture of where I first developed it and where we ended up with it now. The newest version uses bearings to smooth out the motion and make it easier to build. This is an articulating design so that you can have this position wherever you need it, whether you want to type on it, just play FPSs or flight sims. It also folds nicely and out of the way here so that it's, you know, it's clean and easy to get in and out of the rig without the keyboard tray being in your way. My original design just used all these custom built pieces. Again, I changed this around. Uh, I'll show you the separate design for this. But there's now basically uh, roller bearings in here that just make it articulate a lot more easily. And I just use standard bolts. And then these are just 3D printed caps again that sit on top to cover up the bolts. Um, you don't have to have those. I just did them for aesthetic purposes again. But this is the final piece. This tray. I covered with a little bit of uh, rubber just to kind of give it some grip so that this doesn't slide around. Uh, because it's a long articulating arm, there's a little bit of movement in this, oh, not because the joints are moving, but because you have such a wide uh, arm here, you, the torque allowed on it with your body weight is, you know, allows it to do so, a little bit of movement here. Uh, itself, it's, it's tight all the way down. The unit is bolted just straight to the base. Um, there's just a single bolt going up into the shaft there, and I'll post the designs for this thing as well. Um, but that's all there is to it. It just bolts straight up, simple aluminum. Uh, there's definitely some machine parts in here with the caps and so forth. But beyond that, it's pretty much straightforward uh, tubes, as you see, square tubes, which just bolt holes through them now, and, and you know washers and bearings to hold it all together. To change the pitch of the keyboard. On this side there is a push pin here that you need a little uh, pin to push in on but once you do it's a spring-loaded peg that you can thread into the, the piece behind here and again what this does is allows you to adjust the pitch of the keyboard. Now I, I did this so that you can pretty much get this set to whatever angle that's comfortable for you and then leave it. You don't need to constantly change that um, so you know, it's entirely up to you how you want to do that in terms of whether or not you have that as a fixed angle or a pitched angle. I did it again for adjustability, um, but you know, you don't have to do that. The modifications to the keyboard tray had to do with how the different attachment points between the bars worked. So originally I had put blocks into the end of the square tubes and then machined pegs that went into those blocks and then were held down by a set screw at the end of the other arm. And I used Teflon in between the um, arms so that they could pivot and swivel without uh, making any noise or rubbing. And that kind of worked, but what happened was over time, the set screws would slip just ever so slightly, and then you get wobble in the whole assembly. You'd have to loosen it back up, push it together, tighten it back down. And the net net was, I just didn't like how that worked. And it also made things a lot more complicated for people to make because they had to machine all these blocks and pegs and so forth. So one of the things we did was to replace that with just straight bolts that just went straight through the arms. And instead of using uh, complicated shims and washers, we just simply used thrust bearings so that we could separate the two with bearings, top and bottom of the bolt, and then just crank it down nice and snug and tight, and then there wouldn't be any more sag. Uh, so to that end, I had to replace uh, the couplings, which I just drilled through the block. So if you're building this anew, you don't need to do that at all. You would just drill straight through the tubes and that's it. Now you might want to put a tube inside uh, of the square tube so that when you clamp down on the bolts, you don't crush the tube at all. But other than that, um, what I did is, is not necessary to have those big uh, aluminum blocks in the end. In the shaft part that attaches to the base, uh, it's inverted a little bit. So as before, I had a hole and a peg in the top. Now you just want to have a threaded cap that you're attaching 
and also you want to put two set screws on that cap rather than driving push pins into it and that will allow you to remove the cap if you need to and to tighten it up and then just run a bolt straight through the thing and a nut and snug the whole thing up. The base is done is exactly the same way in terms of attachment to the main rig. You just simply have a threaded bolt that goes up into the bottom so nothing has changed there. So the other videos talk about the basics of building the seat. All we did was change how we made the tilt adjustment so that it's fixed to eliminate vibrations and to make the whole setup a lot more rigid. Okay, so another change we're making here to this thing is originally I had these standoffs right here. And, you know, you basically had this pin, which, you know, had a circlip on it that it was clipped in to hold it. Anyway, you could pull it out and you could adjust it to different heights, which would change the, the pitch of the unit. So, you know, you could go basically up or down and adjust it to whatever height you want. But what I find is that this contraption makes a little bit of noise. Okay, so there's no real rocket science here. All we have to do is make a new pin. It's basically this size from here to here. Okay, so to start with, you basically have to cut a piece. It's roughly this length. Nothing scientific about this. I already know how long I need to make the thing. I just need to mark it and cut it. Once I make the first one, I'll just duplicate it with the second one. Okay, so both are cut, and as you can see, we're in the right ballpark for the standoff. They basically are now in the exact same spot. Okay, so here it is all the way bolted together now. One little tip, um, loosen all these bracket bolts first before you tighten these up. It'll just make it easier to pinch this tube tight. And don't over tighten these because you'll crush the tube. Now, you could put an insert in there to block that, but it's just as easy to just run the bolt through and snug it up for it's nice and tight, as you can tell. This thing is not going to go anywhere. I don't care how much you weigh. So you're in good shape here with this. Okay, so once you get this thing bolted up, you actually want to have it tight and then take out the bottom pins. So I should have told you put those in loose. That way you can swing this thing open and mount this to the bottom of the seat. Another mod we made to the rig was increasing the amount of power in the base shakers. Originally I had pucks in the foot well to send vibrations through the pedal assemblies and those never really worked all that well, didn't transfer much energy through. We also had them underneath of the seat, two of them, and what I found is it was easy to overdrive those and break them. Matter of fact, I did break one. So I wanted to use bigger shakers with a bigger amp. So in this case, I went with a 100 watt amp to drive two base shakers as opposed to the 70 watt amp to drive four pucks. Now, this amp is the same exact size as the old one. The base shaker, on the other hand, is substantially bigger and it's bolted right to the bottom of the table that's holding your chair. Uh, the wood base that's holding your chair. Once that's in, all we have to do is run a sp stereo cable through, use a strain relief by stapling that down, and that's it. Um, it's now hooked up underneath the seat and it can drive a tremendous amount of power now directly up through the seat because of the solid connections we've now made. Okay, so we got the deck off. That's basically just four screws right here that are holding down in each corner here and here and in those two corners up there where those reinfor little square reinforcements are. So that's all. It just sits on there and that's what holds the pedal box together. Um, there's the pedal assembly right there that just rides along the top of the track. Now what I'm doing is I've flipped this thing upside down. Okay, so I got it centered up on the board. And I'm just going to go ahead and screw it down. I'm just using these little wood screws basically here for uh, they're, they're wood screws that you can get when you buy the electronics gear. It's specifically for cabinet screws is what they're called. So I think these are probably, I don't know, I'm guessing they're one inch just looking at them here. Uh, either way, just make sure they don't go all the way through. That's a three quarter inch board. That uh, base on that amp thing there, that uh, base unit is about uh, a quarter inch or so thick, so it should be fine. Okay, so I got the wire hooked up and uh, basically just going to go ahead and lift this board up and set it in. And then once I have it flushed back up, we'll go ahead and screw it down. All right, so pedal box is back in now, and uh, that's pretty much it. Obviously, it's pretty damn filthy back in there, but anyway, uh, I put the little brass stand off. It's underneath there. You can probably make it out. That's what keeps this thing elevated an eighth of an inch, and when you crank this down and tighten it up, it causes this not to bow since it's basically tightening up on top of that little brass washer there. Okay, so 
Next, we're going to pull out this amp and replace it with the 70 watt or the 100 watt amp. This is the 70 watt. Okay, so now that it's unbolted, this thing will just lift right out. It's kind of a snug fit, but there you go. Pretty much that's it. Now I just got to unplug it there. I used uh, some male female quick connectors. You get them at a hardware store and just crimp them on the end of your cables just to make it easier to, to plug and unplug these things. So, okay, so for the amp, we're replacing that with a Dayton Audio SA100, as you can see here. Anyway, it's pretty much the exact same thing as the other amp we're pulling out. It just has a little bit more juice on it and can drive these guys at 8 ohms uh, a little bit better than the uh, 70 water can. So it turns out that they did change the wiring. Um, as you can see on the left side, these two wires are from the 70 watt amp, and on the right side, they're from the 100 watt amp. And you notice that the negative feed is much smaller. It's a male connection on the negative side, which is very different from this one, where it's just two female connections. So, uh, the wire we had used previously to hook them up just had two male connections, and I'm using, I'm just using these things here, which are pretty simple to find at any hardware store, and anyway, I'm just going to snip those leads off and put a couple of female connectors on there so I know it'll go right together. Okay, so now that we have uh, our connectors done on the amp, you'll notice that I just have a cable here with some bare leads and the other side of the connectors for the amp. Now what I need to do is hook up the speakers. Now we're hooking the speakers up because there's only two this time. Uh, we're going to hook them up in a serial configuration. Each one of those is a 4 ohm and that speaker bit uh, base amp and we're going to um, base shaker. We're going to hook them up uh, so we end up with 8 ohms at this end when it goes into the amp. And the way we're going to do that is to connect basically the positive on this to the positive on the first speaker and the negative coming off of the first speaker to the positive on the second speaker and then the negative coming off of the second speaker back to the negative going to the amp. That will be a serial configuration. If you were to draw this out, it would like flow through both speakers and then back to the amp as opposed to connecting all the reds together and all the blacks together, which would be more of a parallel configuration. Just screw okay, so all the bits are back together now. The new amp is in, picking up power. It's set on auto, so it'll automatically shut off when the computer stops feeding it. I think it takes something like 10 minutes for it to actually kick back off. But... Okay, so we're starting to put these in. One little tip, don't tighten these up when you put this thing in. Just, you know, put one or two in just to kind of snug it up a little bit and then keep it loose so you can kind of shift the thing around. These are just... Uh, I think they're M6 uh, Allen bolts that just go right on in there. And yeah, pretty much that's it. Stuff them in, take your Allen key, and thread them in. That's pretty much all you need to do until they go on in. Then just snug the whole thing up. Once you get the last one in there, go ahead and start tightening them down. Where this goes in, I actually use these rubber bumpers. Kind of hard to see here. But uh, basically they're just a rubber bumper that I used and drilled through and it helps to perform a little bit of shock isolation from the bottom of the uh, chassis itself. There's a washer top and bottom on these things, a washer top and bottom on these things and uh, just goes together like so. And the rail will sit on top of these. You know there's washers that go underneath those rubber grommets that goes in the hole thusly. Um, all I can tell you is put them roughly in place. These things are going to get knocked around when you go to put the seat in. And first thing you want to do is put this rubber grommet on with the washer already on there and just slide it up on the bolts. This will help hold it in place. This makes it a lot easier to put the seat assembly back together when you go to add it back on. And that's probably, that's about it. And I got to jack the rig up so I can reach underneath to tighten the bolts down. But that's it. I'll just set the, uh, the unit in and bolt it back up. Okay, so now you can see what I'm talking about. So the things in there and the bolts are basically, it's sitting on the bolts. And I want to lift those up one corner at a time and get them lined up. And that way I don't have to fight with all the grommets and everything at the same time. Now, one other thing I want to show you is that I've jacked the thing up so that I can get under it. Be really careful with this. Make sure you've, you've got it well balanced because, you know, bottom line is this thing weighs a lot. You know, I mean, in total with all this stuff on here, you're probably talking about, you know, two and a half, 300 pounds. And uh, you know, if that thing comes down in your arm and you've got a relatively thick arm, 
you'll crush that arm pretty easily. I don't know if you'll break it, depending on what you're doing it on, but that's a lot of weight and you won't get your arm out by yourself. So just be careful with that. Okay, so you can see I've got the two back ones in um, right now, the two bolts in. And all I can say is don't try to get all four in first. Just get one or two in and then go ahead and put a, a washer and a nut on loosely. And I mean, just, just turn it on just so it's fully on the thread, but don't even try to snug it up or anything at this point because you want to be able to pull the seat up and down and scooch it around to get the other two front ones in. Now here's another little mod that I added um, to the rig right down here where the carpet edge came up. Of course, it looks kind of ratty now because I just got done peeling it off. But I went ahead and made a, another bar that sits on here and helps the number one, hide that edge, hold that carpet, and also keep it from peeling and getting ratty. Now, this piece of carpet flops over, which is on the pedal, and I've actually bought some new carpet that's a much heavier and thicker version of the carpet, which I'm going to cut and place on there too, which will drape over and that'll help. And I'm also going to put it down here where you step in, um, so to give it a little bit more wear resistance, because the carpet that's in there is fine on the sides, uh, but it doesn't take the, the wear and tear over the years. Now that said, uh, you know, I've been using this thing for about a part of four or five years now, and so it's actually held up really well. But this thicker carpet won't shrink, it won't move, and won't wear quite as easily. Okay, so I've got the rig turned on, but I've got the stereo turned off. So any sounds you hear are the, the vibrations that are actually coming through the rig. So hopefully this will be captured. Now I am using an Oculus. So uh, you're not going to get the triple screen right now, but this is really just to give you an idea just uh, how much volume is coming through. And you're really just hearing the low end with the just sound the chassis is making, even with the music that's playing right now. So let's, uh, let's start up something, and I'll, I'll try to pick a car that has some good low end rumble to it. So let's choose a Corvette. So you really, I mean, right now, the amount of feedback I'm getting is tremendous through the bass. Uh, and the nice thing is that these, whoop, these mods that I've put on the, the chassis with the seat, it's pretty much eliminating all the, the shaky kind of rattling noises I was getting from the seat and elsewhere. The low end is really great. I mean, I'm feeling road noise, a lot of minor vibrations. I could probably even turn the frequency down a little bit and eliminate some of these minor chassis sounds um, but for right now um, it's really working well in terms of the physical sensation I'm getting back from the car I mean everything all the all of this is giving a nice a bit of buzz to it in terms of the road feel and also the engine sounds and any curb or grass feels that I'm getting too is coming across very nicely Okay, in closing, one of the other points I would like to make here is that in order to build this thing, you just can't get around the fact that you're going to need access to essentially milling equipment and machining equipment. You have to be able to cut metal and shape it. And you can't do this with just a hand drill and a hand saw. And there's just the parts are too complicated and the tolerances are too small in order to do that. Um, you can sort of take some of the designs I have, or you can take the designs I have and give them to a machine shop and have them make them for you. And if you happen to have a friend who has a machine shop or if you have access to one, obviously that's, that's great. Um, for me, I have 10 year old mini mills and mini lays that I probably paid $1,000 for for both ages ago. And, um, you know, there's probably another $500,000 in all the tooling, you know, the, the um, end mill cutters and, and other types of things like that, calipers, etc. So, you know, just keep in mind that you don't want to go and invest in all that if you're just trying to build this rig. <clears throat> now, if you need um, printed parts, clearly I can post those somewhere where you could just pay per unit and get those shipped to you like a Shapeways. <clears throat> but the machine parts, you're literally going to have to machine those. So if you can't find a place to do that, um, it, there's a, definitely an, a, a cost involved in that. Um, the other side of this is if you know of a place that will make one-off parts for relatively inexpensively, I will be glad to post uh, inventor models to those sites so that you can order those parts, but I haven't found any, and I don't know of any, that are inexpensive in terms of one-off. Um, 
And usually if I'm building 500 of them, yeah, then it gets a little bit reasonable. Anyway, if you know of them, please email me and I will be glad to post those um, to help you with your rig. Uh, but just know that there are some costs involved that are, I would call, hidden costs to manufacturing something like this at this point. So like always, I'm closing the video with a little quick clip of driving with this thing as you now see uh, you know, how it's built. And so this is the current rendition of the rig now with all the keyboard trays and monitor racks and everything adjusted and done. So enjoy and thank you for watching.